Good day. My name is Norm Bauer, and this afternoon we're sitting on the second floor porch of the Sudbury Valley School in Framingham, Massachusetts. And with me is the director of that school, Dr. Daniel Greenberg. Dan, it's very nice to be with you it's today. It's nice to be here, but I'm not the director. You're not the director. <laughs> well, we were wondering. Tom and I were wondering about the title, so it's, it was It'll with be Dan. staff member. All right, staff and member. There's and no director. So, Dan, would it be all right if I referred to you as, as Dan here? That's the only way. Okay. Uh, and as I say, my name is Norm. Um, let's start with just a brief overview of how your school came into being. We started to plan the school back in 1965, 1966. A small group of people, mostly people that my wife and I knew, out of the New York area. And uh, the, uh, the, the initial ideas of the school, I guess, emerged from our own personal deep dissatisfaction with the educational system that we were involved in. Both of us were academicians. I was teaching at Columbia at the time. And several, several people whom we knew uh, were also disaffected. Those were the mid-60s. The interesting part of it is that as we moved up to this area, which is a co an accidental event, uh, we came into contact with a large group of people that we had never known before. And the, as we spread the idea of the school among the population, we attracted dozens and ultimately hundreds of people to the concept, none of whom we had known. Okay. So, and that's important to understand the school because it so many schools were formed in the mid and late 60s at that time, the so-called free school movement, right. alternative school right movement. We never felt part of that, and we were never really accepted into the so-called movement at the time because it turns out that virtually all of those schools, as I'm sure you'll remember, were founded by groups of people who had fairly strong political that is correct. Motivations. Free school so, movement especially. Which is, yeah. which is fine. I have nothing against people with political views starting their own schools, but we weren't like that at all. The people in this school were attracted to the educational philosophy. And from the beginning, the people were a very wide variety of economic class, educational background, political convictions. We had everything from conservative Republicans to to radical left-wingers. I mean, let's, let's just stop for a minute. Now, you said they were attracted to your philosophy of education. How could did you, they find out? Well, first of all, uh, yeah, how did they find out? But let's uh, backtrack and ask a prior question, and that is just what was the aim that you had in mind well, in terms of schooling? these things develop with time, but at the very root of the concept of this school were two ideas which are related and which have stayed constant from the beginning. The first was an educational one and stemmed, I guess, from my experience in teaching and my wife's experience in being a student. And that is the simple idea that children or adults are not going to learn something that they don't really want to learn, that they're not really motivated to learn on their own. And I guess everybody really learns that the hard way. We all try to get around it one way or another in, in our classrooms. Whenever you sit in a classroom situation, you're always going to have in front of you a large percentage of people who basically don't want to be there, mm -hmm. who have to be there for whatever That's reason. And no matter how long you've taught or how good a teacher you are, and I tried every trick of pedagogy, I read up on everything you could ask for to make my classes interesting, to motivate the students, to do all these things that supposedly good pedagogical practice tells you to do. And I was considered to be a great entertainer, if I can use that term. That's where I was but I was not a great teacher because the people in front of me weren't eager to learn what I wanted to learn. And I guess somewhere along the line, I don't know why, why I made this break or my wife made it, but somewhere along the line I just became convinced that the whole idea is useless from scratch. The, the idea of trying to inculcate something that people are not really eager to receive. In other words, interest is a thing that is a basis for learning. It has to start with, with a student's really burning interest, not just, yes. not just mild curiosity, not just I wonder yes. what's there, but really burning interest. And our experience, my own life experience has been that, I'm sure yours has been. When you talk to laymen out there and they, they back off for a minute, they'll all agree that the things they really love to do, their hobbies usually, you can't stop them. If they're into fishing, the wives can't keep them Marvelous. Home. That's right. You know, if they're into carpentry, they'll do it day and night. If they're lucky to be into what they're doing for a living, then they're away from home all the time. You know, they're totally engrossed. And you, the point is you can't really stop them. My wife right. has often said about this school, if we do nothing else in this school, 
but not present a barrier. We've already, we've already done what you paid your tuition for. Yeah, yeah. The rest is gravy. Yeah. So that's the central educational idea, and which is to let children of all ages completely free, be completely free to do what they're interested in doing without any preconceived curriculum or set of ideas or set of notions. I have to take a step backwards on that idea. Do you mind us going on uh, about this? I just ask one question before. Are you going to move into that second uh, basic? Not quite yet. Okay, all right, I'm not quite ahead. ready to. I want to take a step backwards because from the very beginning, the question obviously comes up, well, how are, if these kids can be allowed to do whatever they want, how are they going to be viable adults in the community? And that's a valid question. And, and I think that if it wasn't that we were in the 1960s, it may have been difficult to answer that question because it's idyllic, perhaps, to let children do what they want, but it may not be practical. And there we were helped by the fact that, that you know, and I know you know it, and a lot of others of us do, that we're in the post-industrial age. And, if an, and enough people understood that to be willing to send their children here. In the post-industrial age, of course, what people are looking for in the business world, for example, is people with initiative, people who are creative, people who do things on their own, people who don't have to be prompted, the opposite of what people look for in the industrial age. In the industrial age, the worst thing you could have in a major, co in a major industrial company is a person oh, with smart. creative initiative. Your point is marvelous. And, yeah. and therefore, you, therefore, it would really be a disservice to people 50 years ago to produce people like this because they'd all be oddballs and mavericks and they could never get a job because they'd be thrown out as being troublemakers. But today, what the schools produce are, are misfits to the community because the schools produce people who literally don't know what to do unless they're told. And what companies are looking for today are people who can go out there and cre be creative, be entrepreneurial. Even large corporations uh -huh. are looking for that. And it's ver very interesting to see that in, in students who come into the school, for example, at an older age, at 12, 13, 14, the length of time that it takes them simply to get used to the idea that they have to figure out what to do, that there isn't somebody around to tell them what to do all day. Now, we never had that problem with a four-year-old yeah. or a three-year-old. Well, when a busy. kid comes here at, say, 13 or 14, it takes a year or it's, two to even get tragic. used to it. Yeah. You can only feel that you're witnessing a tragedy because here's a wonderful human being, and they're at a total loss. Uh -huh. Even Mother Nature agrees with that. That's right, right. <laughs> the second major idea was that the country is a democracy. We're talking all the time about training our youth for citizenship in a democratic society. And yet, the schools are the one major autocratic hierarchical institution that's left in the community, sanctioned by, by the community as, as autocratic. And it is such a complete anomaly that it, that it simply didn't make sense to us. The only thing that possibly made sense to us to train children to become viable members of a democratic community is to immerse them in a democratic community from the very earliest age. Democracy means, I mean, even Plato knew this. He wrote about it. Aristotle wrote about it. Democracy means the willingness of citizenship to take responsibility for themselves, to feel responsibility for the community. There's no way to do that if for the first and formative 12 years of your life, you're in an environment where you never take responsibility, you never have to worry about your decisions or their consequences. So in other words, one of the aims would be to build responsible citizenship in these kids. Through democracy. And yes. the way to do it is to be democratic. Not to play democracy, not to have a student government, not to give classes and democratic responsibility, but to say, look, this is your school. This is everybody's school. Your vote counts as much as I do. Now make it work. Okay. And I remember so vividly, one of these memories that sticks with you till the grave. Yeah. When we were writing the bylaws of the uh -huh. corporation uh -huh. to incorporate the school, the attorney and one of our original trustees was a state senator from this area and a graduate of Yale Law School. And he was helping us draft him. And at one point he just got up and started pacing the floor and saying, four-year-olds have the vote? Jesus! How can that be? Yeah. You can't be serious. Yeah. And I said to him, Bill, <laughs> that's what we want. It doesn't make any less sense than having... Are we okay? All right, very good. And then ha it doesn't make any less sense than having unproperty males have the vote made to, to our founding fathers. 
Yeah. The fact is that all of the people who, who predicted failure for this school because of our democratic principles were wrong. The school has run beautifully. We're 20 years old. You can see for yourself that the campus is beautifully maintained. The building is beautifully maintained. You know what I can also see? That there's rain. Well, I can see that, but I think this is very exciting. This adds a dimension we couldn't put in even <laughs> if we tried. <laughs> but the fact is, Dan, we came here, and you were voting on staff. That's right. And I asked the students down there. I remember Janine was one. Uh, Todd was another right. at the time. And they were talking about who voted. And they said everyone in the school voted. However, there was a unique aspect to this. I asked them whether everybody had to vote. And they said, no, everyone did not have to vote. Would right. you elaborate on that for a minute, it's that a, particular aspect? It's exactly the same as the world at large. You have to learn, nobody makes us vote in this country. And we're always complaining about the low participation in, the, in national elections. Now, as the children know, that learn that their vote really counts, they tend to vote. Yeah. But that's the only way they'll find out. Yes. If you make, anything you make them do will become distasteful. Yes. That's clear. If you made them vote, then democracy would be distasteful. Yeah, yeah. Now we have these two aims in your philosophy. Now the question is, how are we going to get to them? Put them together in the simplest and purest possible form of a school, namely a school which is purely democratic, run like, run like a New England town meeting, where every single person in the school community has a vote. How many kids are in the community? Well, today there's about 140. 140. And we're getting soaked. We are getting <laughs> soaked. <laughs> All right, we'll stop for a moment. <clears throat> Watch it, Dan. Oh. Okay. Well, would you believe that we were rained on so hard we really had to stop this tape for a minute? We're now inside. We've seen a wonderful gathering of kids. And I wonder, Dan, if we could start with that and talk a little bit about how you and your fellow faculty members and the people associated with the school, how you see children and youth. What is the nature of human nature as you see it? Well, the, there are, that's, that's a rather a long story to answer, but uh -huh. why don't I pick on the most important features as it okay. applies to the school? Yeah. I think the key feature that we focus on is human curiosity, which is actually, as I know you know from current studies in psychology, mammalian curiosity, and for all we know, it even goes to lower animals. The absolutely fundamental instinctual drive that people have to explore and learn and find out about their environment, and that apparently all animals have. May I just add that I'm revealing it, because honestly, as I got close to this school, curiosity was building up, and in, in fact, curiosity motivated the letter to you and this sort of that's, thing. I'm sure that's so, true. Yeah, yeah. And that's clearly the motivating factor. Of course, there are classic studies now where even, even lower mammals will almost starve themselves to death exploring something rather than eating. Now, we start as that, and of course Aristotle in his, uh, in his metaphysics opens the metaphysics by saying human beings are naturally curious, and that's where everything they want starts to know. Them, that's right. They want to know. Yeah. That's their that's desire. Right. That's where we start, and we have found that to be almost too self-evident to talk about, especially in little children where it hasn't been doused yet. Everybody knows it about little children. In fact, they know it so much about two-year-olds that they refer to the age of two and thereabouts as the terrible twos. And the terrible twos is nothing more than the age at which children become mobile enough and expressive enough to actually go out there and do something about it, and most parents don't want them to. That is our starting point, that it's built into the mind, built into human nature, to want to explore, to want to understand, to want to create models and worldviews that will make something sensible out of the environment. Mm -hmm. And if you let them do that, there are no limits that they can't reach. Now, you, you understand, this is not an ethical judgment. We don't have a naive viewpoint that all children are angelic, that they're all good. I understand that, yes. This is the, on the contrary, we accept as part of the natural order of things evil, we accept unhappiness, and that's key. And I want to stress that one thing before we move on to another topic. One of the things we are not focused on in this school is happiness as a goal. I happen to think that we're the happiest school I've ever known and that our children are the happiest, but not always. Because real happiness for us comes out of meeting a challenge and overcoming it and achieving something. But as you're getting there, if you're gonna be worth anything, you're gonna go through an awful lot of tremendous failures and disappointments and oh, lows wow. and yes. sadness. Yes. Now, the, the argument that I've always had with the progressive movement from when I first became 
involved with it was that their central goal is happiness and they will do cartwheels to keep children from disappointment from failure from anything negative and i think that prepares them very poorly for life we tell our kids openly look we'll support you when you're down i mean we'll be nice to you but there's nothing we can do about it. You have to fight that battle. That's what life is about. Life is about being bored and climbing out of it, being down and climbing out of it, failing and coming back and trying again. So what you're talking about is opening spaces, opening places for possibilities to emerge and develop. And, right? and, not, and not worrying about the mental, the pleasure or the happiness that comes out of it. A friend of mine once said, the difference between you and a progressive school is in a progressive school, kids are supposed to like what they do, and in your school they're supposed to do what they like. Yes. And that's rather it's an interesting thing. Ra rather yeah. to the point. How do you organize the kids? How do you how do you do you organize them by grade levels, by age levels? Do you organize them in any particular ways? The school is completely ungraded. It's very much like a community or a village. The kids come the school is open from eight thirty to five. It's a day school. The kids can come any time. They'll come eight thirty, they'll come nine, ten, some will come at twelve. They'll leave any time they want to. Uh huh. They come and they set about their activities, whatever they happen to be. I don't know what they are. They have no schedule. They don't have to report anywhere. They check in on a check-in list because, and that's voluntary, because they have to find, we have to know who's here. That's yes. a state requirement. That's about the only state requirement we have. Uh -huh. Then they go about their, their business as they see fit. Some go to the woods. Some go to various different rooms to engage in play, different activities. Of course, from my vantage point, the most important activity any child can un undertake in this school right up until late adolescence is play. Mm -hmm. As far as I'm concerned, I'll take an hour of play against a week of academic study any day because it's through play that they really learn model building, mm -hmm. that they really learn how to make constructs in their minds that they'll later apply to real life. Now you talk about model building and constructs. Would you elaborate on what you mean by that? What are you expecting a child to do when he is model building? What I'm expecting a child to do is to create his or her own mechanisms to form, to make sense out of reality. That is what uh -huh. I call building a model. Okay. It's making some kind of a comprehensive order out of reality. It may not be the same order that you or I have, but it has to have a structure that is comprehensible to the child. Okay. And one of the things that the modern world has found out is that there's a much wider range of viable world models than people used to think 100 years ago. And that, again, is typical of the difference between the industrial age and the post-industrial age. Now, interestingly enough, in the pre-industrial age, that's the way people felt as well. And we know that in early communities, people had a much wider tolerance of visionaries, of mystics, of people who, whom in the industrial era we'd call crazy and we'd put away even mm -hmm. or we'd ignore. Now, today we're going back to that. Today we have a much broader tolerance. What I want kids to be able to do is to be confident in their ability to make structures in their own mind. Now, of course, as they do that, they're going to be measuring this. People say, well, kid can't go off and just make his own world up. And of course, kids don't. That's silly. They don't do that. They're constantly measuring their own models against yours and mine and other people's. That's correct. That's part of the process. They want to. They don't want to be isolated. They want to communicate. They want to be part of reality. But by, uh, but by respecting their own constructs and not tearing them down, we give them the confidence to build real alternatives. We tell them, you have to do the testing against other models, not we. Mm -hmm. And that's the way creativity and real genius comes about. A real genius is a person who is confident enough to create new models, but not so detached that he won't measure them against reality. And, and against the way others see things. Right. I see. Yes. How do you go about, though, uh, assuring yourself or assuring the kids that they are engaged in learning, say, mathematical concepts? I don't. I don't worry about it one bit. Mm -hmm. I really must say that I don't think it makes a bit of difference. I think that 99% of what people learn in school, they never use again. And the other 1% I would doubt about myself. I'm really convinced about that. I'm not, being, I'm not saying this to be, to be facetious. No, you're not. Me. You're not. Tom and, and I, let me just interject here. Tom here and I have been talking about this on the way up, and we were talking about the thousands of things that we were made to learn that we never used. Well, it, it's even worse than that. I used to, in the early days when I would talk about the school, and of course I've been talking about it for 20 or 21 years by now, I used to ask my audiences, if you had the entire map of knowledge, the entire map of human knowledge, and you mark down on that map of knowledge what it is, I, I'm saying to the audience, right, what it is that you never look at, uh -huh. I'll wager with you that that corresponds to what you had in school. And that's literally true, because school has made the few things that they teach, of course, and there are very few things that they teach, they pick out of the sea of knowledge, they pick out some 
trivialities that they consider important, but they never look at them again, most people. Most people never read. Most people would, would run away from Shakespeare, would avoid it like plague. Most people never look at a math book. Most people think science is horrible. You know what I'm talking mm -hmm. about. I know. It's ridiculous. Most people find history boring. It's the most interesting thing in the world. I cannot relate at all to curricula or to anything that is picked out by, by the present educational system as being important, even in history, which I teach a great deal of. I mean, why is it, why are the few subjects that are picked out in the schools more important than others? We never learn Far Eastern history. We never learn the history of India in our schools. We never learn the history of the Balkans. Why? Are those people less important or less interesting than the people we learn? Oh, I'm with you. That's an epistemic uh, question of the first rank. What you're saying is that there's a political act in, in choosing what these things are of course. to be taught. And that political act narrows the scope that would normally yes. be available to these children on their own. Yes. It doesn't broaden it, it narrows it. I hear a lot of people resisting, well, if you don't make children learn certain things, they'll never be exposed to them. And it's, of course, just the opposite. What you make them learn, you drive them away from. If you leave them alone, they will seek to expose themselves to more than will ever dream. These kids are exposed to a hundred times more than I was at their age. I yes. know that for a fact. All right. Now, you do have a faculty. You're a member of the faculty. You call we call, it, staff, we call ourselves staff, and that's very deliberate. All right. It's deliberate because we don't want to project the image of being teachers in the traditional sense of the term. All right. We, we are here to serve the school meeting and the needs of the school meeting. And in that capacity, we respond to the requests of children, not only for instruction, but for conversation, for companionship, and for keeping the school together. I pick up trash, I do the garbage along with everybody else, I clean along with everybody else. And the other staff members the same? Absolutely. Okay. And that's important to us. There's no ranking of administrative staff, clerical staff, right. teaching staff, and it's very important. It's a very important part of modeling because yes. people are people and that doesn't make it. And that's, by the way, let me say that is directly related to the fact that we don't have anything like tracking in this school as well. Right. We have kids who turn out to be carpenters, doctors, PhDs in mathematics, rock musicians, chefs. They're all sitting together. 15 years after they've graduated, they're still all friends. Now, that did not happen to me. I went to the Bronx High School of Science. And the only people that Bronx High School of Science graduates want to consort with is other Bronx High School of Science graduates. We never thought of mixing with vocational school graduates. They were beneath us. Uh -huh. In fact, physicists hardly mixed with biologists. It's a miracle I married my wife. Oh, She's yeah. a biologist. That's not a joke. And that kind of thing wouldn't occur to the children in this school. Uh -huh. People are people, and every interest, as long as it's pursued for its excellence and for its own interest, is just as legitimate yes. in their eyes as any yes. other. And one interest, presumably, can lead to another one as exactly. you're working through it. Now, let's go back to a minute. You mentioned something about a meeting. Would you elaborate on this meeting that you said you're, the staff members are a part of and you advise the school, students? On? The town meeting, the, it's called the school meeting, and in that sense it's taken its name from Neil Summerhill. But yeah. the, the school meeting basically runs the entire school. There are no, and this is one of the sore points, I would say, for us, because so many schools flirt with democracy mm -hmm. and have organized student participation in part of the decision-making process. And if, as far as I'm concerned, democracy is like pregnancy. You know, you can't be a little bit. If people in a democratic society know that there are certain crucial areas of power that are reserved to an authoritarian elite, they know that that when the chips are down, it's not a democratic society. Now, one of the beauties of this country, as far as I'm concerned, is that there are no such reserved authoritarian niches. I mean, our democracy is far from perfect, but the fact is that the voters can throw out their Anyone they want. At any time, right. period. Whether you're in a war, in the middle of a civil war, they could have thrown out Lincoln. That's right. Now, that to me is what, what I'm talking about in the school. The school is democratic. All the decisions are made by the school meeting. How to spend money, all the important ones. How to spend money, who to hire, who to fire, how to run this, what rules apply in the school, how the rules are to be enforced. How often does this meeting hold? It meets once a week. Once a week. More often if necessary, but usually once a week is enough. Yeah. It usually lasts about two hours. And of course it delegates a lot of it. Where does the agenda for the meeting come from? It gets it, it gets published. Anybody can put any item on the agenda. They can. They put it in the secretary's folder, and the secretary publishes every item that's put forward. Is that right? It's printed before the meeting. It's posted. You may have seen it posted on the bulletin board. There, every single week, a full printed agenda is posted. There can be no surprises. All important decisions undergo two readings, as they're called, at two successive meetings, so people have a chance to mull them over. But this school has run that way from the beginning. And the interesting thing is that our increase in expenditures, for example, 
is way below that of public or private schools in the country at large. Over a period of 20 years, we have hardly had an increase in our budget in real dollars. And of course, you know, in regular schools, the real dollar increase in budgets has been something like three or fourfold. Yes. Now, the reason for that is in order for you to get an expenditure through the school meeting, you've got to justify the need. People don't just go out here and buy a microscope because they think it would be nice to have a microscope in the school, because you should have one in a school. Mm -hmm. People say, we want a microscope, and the question asked in the school meeting for is, who needs it? Who wants it? Why? Yes. The question is justifying. That's right. The normative question is posed, exactly. but they have to justify it. Exactly. Tradition. And if they can't, it's not voted in. And because that's a long tradition here, people don't even bother to ask anymore if they can't justify it. Yeah. And that's why our, budget, our budgets don't go up. I used to teach in a physics department where, where I could buy anything at Columbia University, anything I wanted, whether people needed it or not. I had beautiful equipment. I might as well flush it down the toilet. It was useless. Here, things get used. If they don't get used, they're not here. I see. And a practice of thinking and doing things normatively. That's a really important lifetime that's, practice. That's, that's exactly. And they get trained from age four. They do. Now, I heard somebody, I think it was Hal Geddes, or Geddes, right. and I talked with uh, right. a staff member. Uh, Hal was telling me about corporation. Would you, uh, would okay. you elaborate on we that? Have a, we have a little, a, a little phenomenon here called school corporations. It's our substitute for departments. And what happens is when a group of people get interested in a certain area and feel that they need more continuity and more consistency in supporting the work in that area, they form, they get chartered by the school, meaning as a school corporation. For example, we have a school corporation for photography, a corporation for music, a corporation for, uh, there's a smoking room corporation to maintain the school smoking room, a woodworking corporation. There's a whole a science corporation. Every interest area where there's a group of people who are there and who sustain that interest, form a corporation. The corporation is an entity to which the school meeting delegates the responsibility for managing that interest. And they're so in turn the responsible money. to the school meeting. That's right. And so they'll get money and they'll get perhaps a room. And, but the nice thing about corporations is that unlike departments, they die. The problem with the department is it never dies. Mm -hmm. You have a department and it goes on, it has people, it has rooms, it has material long after the interest has died. We've nice. had here, when the interest group dies, the corporation gets unchartered. So we had a leather working corporation oh, once neat. for four or five years. Tremendous activity when leather work was the yeah. fad. You remember in yeah. the early yes. 70s? And then the fad died and we just didn't have any more students interested in it. So all the leather equipment was put in the attic very neatly and the leather work corporation disappeared and that room became the room of the woodworking corporation. Oh, now that would never happen in another yes. environment. That's you true. See? That's true. And that keeps the place up on its toes, viable. We're constantly asking, is this, are these people still active? And if not, goodbye. Yeah. Now, Dan, I'll tell you, in a traditional school, they would talk about these kids having to learn some basic knowledges, basic skills. Um, and they would talk about reading, writing, arithmetic, perhaps a little computer science, uh, computer capability now. But generally, those would be the basics in a traditional idiom. In your school, what would be some of the basic things that you would want your kids to be acquiring in the course of their living together? The one and only thing that we care that they acquire is the ability to be responsible for themselves. That is to say, to make decisions that affect their lives, to understand how they affect their lives, and to be able to carry them through in an effective way, I have the see. confidence to carry them through. That's why we accentuate their freedom to make decisions, but their need to live by them as well. We don't bail them out either. I'm going to get back to the basics. I haven't forgotten okay. what you're asking. Okay. But you see, we don't bail them out either. So if a child has made a certain decision to engage in some activity and then comes back a year later and says, you know, I really wasted my time in that and that was wrong, our answer is, that's right. If that's what you concluded, you did waste your time. Now you learn from that. Next time, your decision probably won't waste your time as much. If they walk out of here at the age of 16, 17, 18, 19, whatever it is, having learned the art of weighing alternatives, uh making reasonable decisions based on projected outcomes, and then living with the outcomes and self-correcting for the outcomes, they've got something that you couldn't buy for all the gold in Christendom. Now, here's the point. The so-called basic skills of the schools are trivial. They're trivial. A person, a person who says, I want to be a doctor, of course he's going to learn how to read. That's absurd. It's trivial for him. He's, I mean, he's never going to be able to read a book. You know how long it takes him to learn how to read? A month. He doesn't sit for six years going through stupid little reading books. In fact, reading books hardly ever get used. He reads. He wants to read magazines. He wants to read the latest. Same with mathematics. Now, I, we have kids who, who never learn mathematics. Look, I'll be honest with you. My own son, who is now 
a very successful photographer in Chicago uh -huh. and is, the, uh, runs a successful business of his own. He's 26. He does things that I wouldn't have dreamt of doing until I was in my mid-30s, but he doesn't know hardly any math. Now, he doesn't need it. I don't know if Mozart needed math either, and I don't care. You, you see what I'm saying? I'm so, I They're understand not, exactly. It's not important to everybody to have the same set of basics. And where you come down to the nitty-gritty, like reading or writing, they figure that out on their own. Yeah. You don't have to tell them. You tell them, they'll avoid it. Yeah. You don't tell them, they'll go after it. But wouldn't you say there's one thing that your school, has, that the kids have in common with you and me and with all people, the cross-section of people in this building, and that is they are all engaged in problem solving and Absolutely. weighing alternatives. That's the key. But they're, they're setting their own problems. That's another thing. It's an, I, I mean, we can go on for hours on this. This so-called pseudo art of problem solving, where people sit kids down in classrooms and give them fake problems. Oh, and then, this means nothing to them. It's just a, it's a it's a meaningless game, and the results don't ever amount to anything. Here, their problem solving is always in real life. And if you walk around the school, you'll see what I mean. All their games are problem solving. All of their human interactions are problem solving. A, an 11 year old kid trying to figure out how to relate to other friends, how to get this one to be a friend rather than an enemy, how to play this game, how to get in that, is solving real life problems. It may not sound very important to you, but they're important to them. And because they're important to them, they're going to apply all of their creative skills to solving that problem at that time. They'll later transfer this ability to focus, concentrate, play alternatives to any other problem in the world. Dan, have you read Dewey's How We Think? I, mean, I don't want to put you on the spot on that, but Dewey wrote a book, yes. How We Think, in 1906 yes. or so. Yes. I mean, yes. I mean, chapter six is coming right out of what you're saying. <laughs> yes. And of course, he was resisted. You referred earlier to the fact that the progressives wanted happiness. I would say this, I want to stress this fact, that, that Dewey refused to take on the Progressive Association's presidency because he saw a great difference between what they were advocating and what he was saying in his theory about right. how people learn. Yes, okay. I know that. Yeah, that very That's interesting thing thinking. about the basics. I was really very pleased to hear. How do how do the uh, how do the kids relate to you and to the and to the staff members? Do they? I hear them refer to you as as uh, using your first name. Always, right. everybody here is on a first name basis, but much more important than the first name basis, which could be pseudo affected, yes. is the fact that because staff members here don't have any latent authority or any hidden authority, no power that they can exercise institutionally over the children, they relate to us on a really human level. Yes. For ki and the fact that I can't look at a kid, no matter how angry I am at what he's doing, I can't say you have to stay after school today. I can't say you have to sit in this room and be quiet. I can't do it. I, don't, I can't send it to the principal. I can't send it to somebody's office. The, wor the, the only thing I can do if I'm angry at somebody who's broken the rules is I can do what every other person in the school does. I can take a piece of paper called a complaint form, file a complaint with the judicial committee, which is an arm of the school meeting, and let the judicial committee, which consists almost entirely of students, review the case, try the student. If the student has indeed broken the rule, they will charge the student and they will sentence the student. I don't even come into this. Okay? Now, because I have no authority, punitive or evaluative, I, can't, I don't write report cards. We have no reports, no grades, no written reports, no oral reports. Okay? There's no hidden power. I don't write something to the parents every year that says, Johnny's doing very well this year, he's really coming along. I don't tell them on the phone either. The only person who tells the parents what Johnny's doing is Johnny. And if the parents do call me up, as they sometimes will, and say, oh, come on, tell me, how's Johnny doing? I say, ask Johnny. I mean, I have no complaints. Ask Johnny if you want to know how he's doing. So the only evaluation is what the parent gets through the child. That's right. Or okay. the parent's free to come to the school and look around for him or herself to see yeah. what's going on. But the point I'm making is because I don't have any of those powers, I become human now. I become yes. not a peer in the sense that I'm down at their level. I'm not 12. But I'm um, somebody a 12-year-old can talk to. Now, why, I, I don't even know your age. Is it important? I don't know whether you're my age or older or younger. Ha, is the first thing you did when you came in here ask me my age and figure no, out how no, old? It's, it's, it's absurd. It's yeah. a joke. We laugh when I even suggest something like that, right? right? You talk to Sharon Kane. You talk to Hal Geddes. You talk right. to people. Age means nothing. That's the way it is with these kids from four and up. You can have a conversation with a four-year-old in the school. You, literally, I'm not exaggerating, which is a mature, ordinary human conversation. You may not be that interested in the subject he's talking about at this moment, but he may not be that interested in the subject you're talking about either, nor may I. Yeah. That's the luck. Yeah, the intervenes. I did have a conversation with a four-year-old or a five-year-old at the doorway, and he asked me what we were doing, what we were in here for, what we were going to do, and I well, said, well, we're just... You're a person. Yeah, that's right. 
And that's all that, 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 that counts here. And you, the only way people can relate to each other as people is if there's no hidden power that one has over the other. The minute they understand that, all the barriers are broken away. Now let me ask you another question related directly to this, although it won't appear to be at first. How do you view subject matter? Do you view it as compartmentalized subject matter taught math here at eight, reading at nine? Obviously, you have a view of that. How do you see subject matter? <laughs> I, I find it difficult even to answer that question mm -hmm. because we don't have periods, we don't have time yes. schedules, and we don't okay. anything anything academic, which is so what you're talking about. let me follow about. up now. I, uh, that was coming through. I had to ask the question, though, uh, to get people who are observing this to conceptualize, because they see things compartmentalized, everything mechanically right. laid it on the board. Okay. So what you've done is broken down the walls between the subject matters, too, so that things are fused together and they're used in terms of how they achieve ends. And Absolutely. And that happens all the time. Now, it may be that children on occasion will ask for private tutoring or tutoring in small groups in a compartmentalized subject. That will sometimes happen. Yes, right. And we will accede to that because that's what they want to do at a particular yeah. moment. But in the early years, I used to get into a lot of trouble because I said I would never do anything like that unless the kids came to me on bloody knees. Uh -huh. That was a bit harsh. But you get the gist of what I'm talking about. If they're really motivated, then on narrow subject matter, they go very quickly. I have to tell you a story, because this is a key story. Right. And it's typical of everything that happens in the school. One of the earliest experiences I had in the school was a group of about a dozen children, age 8 to 12, who came and said they want to learn elementary math. They had never learned addition, subtraction, or anything else. And I gave them the whole story that I wasn't interested unless they were ready to work. Okay? They came, and they did it with me. I gave them homework. I said, if you're not willing, just get out of my class. I taught them out of a book, and I, I'm an old hand at teaching math. That's my field. I gave them a book that was written in 1899, which was drill, drill, drill. They ate it up, and in 20 contact hours, they went through the first six years of math and knew it. Okay? And all of my friends, but back then I still had friends in the regular educational community. Now I'm afraid... Uh, you may have they, more friends than you, than they, you think... Uh, but at any rate, case, that, then, all my friends then said, Hey, that's no surprise. These were specialists in math. You know, we've known it all along. It's just that they don't want to learn it, so we have to force it down their throats over six years. But we know that inherently this stuff doesn't take more than about 20 hours to learn. You see what I'm saying? So you, when you do deal with a traditional subject that for some odd reason the kids want to learn, which is very unusual, if they want to do it, it goes like this. Yes. But most of the time, the real knowledge that they get, and you talk to them, they're articulate. Yes, they, they are. They can think straight. They'll listen to you. They're not, their minds aren't closed. This is real knowledge. This is real knowledge. And that they all pick up like sponges. Yeah. Seth was very articulate in explaining to us the whole set of politics. But he's not atypical. I wouldn't say, oh, Seth, now you picked a wonderful brilliance. He is. He's wonderful. He's yeah. very bright. Yeah. But you could have talked to any one of, any one of the kids almost. Yeah. So, we, so you break down su the walls of the subject matter. You break down the walls of the hierarchy. And, and people are really seen as being a part of an indeterminate rather than a determinate That's world, right? right? Where they're That's working exactly out right. uncertainties. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. And they learn to live with that kind of uncertainty comfortably, which yes. is what, what prepares them for oh, living you know. in the 21st century. Yes. That's what people are not used to doing. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah, I understand it. Now, how do you go about getting faculty members who are prepared to handle uh, working with you in an environment like that's this. Another, that's another thing. I have to say, to me, the school is a succession of miracles, and that's another miracle. Because when we first were founded, one of the wisest people associated with us was the moderator of the town meeting of Framingham, who, who was a lawyer, too, and a wonderful a Harvard graduate, a wonderful, wise man. And he looked at me and said, I understand your theories. I don't know whether I agree with them or don't, but I will tell you one thing. He said to me, the real test of this school is going to be whether you can attract new staff. He said, you have 12 people now that have founded the school, and they're wonderful people. But the real key, and he was right, and I knew he was right back then, and I worried about it in the beginning. Well, I want to tell you that over the years, people have come from all over to join the staff. It's the hardest school to be a staff member in that you can possibly imagine. Because you have, what, we, what, what you cannot have is an ego. See, so many people are trained in educational, uh, in schools of education, who are genuinely interested in teaching, say, view themselves as people who have so much to give. Do you know what I'm talking about? I yes, hear that I so much from, 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 from young people who have graduated teachers' colleges. I have so much to give. And they're sincere, and they're genuine, and they really want to. But if you come to this school with that, and there's nobody out there who wants what you have to give, you're shattered. Mm -hmm. You can't survive here for five minutes. You have to learn in a school like this to put your desire to give completely aside 
and to put instead your desire to respond to what someone else wants to take. Now, if you can respond to what someone else wants to take, that's the first big step. But you see, that means a complete eradication of your own agenda for the children. Your yes. agenda for the children it's has going to, to emerge be, out of their conditions. Yeah, exactly. That is right. That's why it's so hard to be a staff member. We've been lucky, though. We've gotten wonderful people. Hal Geddes is, a, is not one of the founders. No, and you know, we have half of, half of the people on the staff, that we have 14 people teaching now. Half of them have been here for 20 years, half of them have is not, that right? are new. Yeah. And this year, in this staff election, for the first time ever, we have three new people who have come, who have visited, and who have tried to get themselves elected. Now, would you elaborate just briefly on the staff election? What do you mean by that? And the staff here is hired on a yearly basis by the school meeting in a secret ballot which is conducted annually in the spring for the next year. Every single student and every staff member votes because they're all members of the school meeting. Of course, the students outvote the staff that way by 14 to 1 or so. Mm -hmm. And that vote determines who the teachers are going to be next year because the school meeting is what hires the teachers. Yes. So you have to literally, it's a political process here to become a teacher and there's no tenure. I've been here 20 years and I have to get reelected every single year. Uh, I think the, the children are basically very understanding. If I may have a bad year, and I don't think they're going to boot me on one bad year, but if I don't keep on my toes, and, and we constructed it that way on purpose. Because I lived through departments and universities where tenured teachers were a disaster. Amen. Yes. I understand what you're saying. So, so in, in other words, it would be almost... No insult to you. No, I no, I understand what you're saying. I'm sure saying. you have tenure. <laughs> no, no, but... Uh, but, but uh, but that has been of concern to me. I mean, uh, I've raised some questions about how we could rectify that, but that takes us aside. Getting back to this for a moment, though, um, would, you, would you say that over the course of time the kids are relatively fair in their assessment of faculty? Would you say that they have a very you know, uh, objective you know, view? You know, you know what Winston Churchill said? It's, it's our favorite saying, of course. All, uh, uh, democracy is a terrible form of government, but all the others are worse. Yes. And that applies here. I think that by and large the kids have made good decisions. Of uh -huh. course, I, I don't always agree with what goes on, and I often lose votes in the school meeting floor. I often propose things that get knocked down. So uh -huh. of course when I, get, when I lose the vote, I'm not enthralled. But the fact is that the school is a strong, vigorous institution after 20 years okay. of enormous struggle. And that could not have happened if we didn't have the kind of real grassroots loyalty right. that only a democracy could produce. Right, let me go to one, uh, a couple of other things here, Dan, that really are very important for understanding. When the kids graduate from here, many of them will go on to, second, to uh, uh, higher education. Right. Many of them will go in other directions. But in any event, they will have to have some standard which they can carry with them to another institution. You don't have credits. You don't have courses, per se. You don't have formal units of work. Is there any way, for example, Hal was telling me, that is, Mr. Geddes was telling me, that, that you have a thesis examination uh, for well, people who are going to graduate from this place? People who want a diploma have to so-called defend their a, a thesis. And the thesis that they have to defend, it's not really an examination. It's actually harder in a way than an examination. It's not on subject matter. They have to defend the thesis that they are ready to take responsibility for themselves in the world at large. Okay. That's the thesis they have to defend. And they have to find a way to convince the hearers, which consist of the entire school community, that they have matured enough to be responsible adults. Would there be an age that have to, they'd have to no. reach for this? We've had people do it at 16, and we've had people do it at, any, at, at 20. Well, are but faculty sitting in on this area? Everybody. Well? Everybody sits in. And the interesting part of this is it's a brutal self-selection process because nobody, one person in history school went up there and tried to put one over on the school and say, I'm grown up and I'm mature and all this and respond to the questions. And that person wasn't awarded a diploma. Fundament by vote, because you vote on the diploma later. Fundamentally, it's a brutal self-selective process because the kids know that they're not going to go up there and make a claim that they can be responsible adults unless they can convince the audience. And can anyone in the audience pose a question? Anybody. And anyone. the questions are tough. They are. And they're real. Yeah. So that's a tough one. Now, let me, let me answer another question related to your standards, which is a little puzzling. So you have a diploma procedure like that, and if they get, go through it successfully, they get a high school diploma. That still doesn't get them into college, for example. Our batting average on students getting into college is essentially 1,000, in the sense that any student who's wanted to go has gotten into college, and usually the college are their first choice. This without transcripts, without records, without, without any kind of school recommendations. Okay, how did they do that? We always said that would happen. 
And you'll sympathize with this when, when you hear what I say, because I used to be on the admissions committee at Barnard College, and I remember the ennui with which I used to sit there and look at hundreds and hundreds of applications, all of which were the same. Basically, they're all good students, they all have wonderful recommendations, they're all great kids. And then every now and then you'd get one person who was obviously a real person. They may have a C average, but that person would write an essay and say, look, forget my grades. They would say it right on the essay. The reason I want to go to Barnard is because you have a wonderful astronomy department. I know Professor Motz, and I've read all his works, and I want to study with him and apprentice to him. This is my life dream. And you look at this and you say, this is a real human being. That's what our kids do. Every one of our kids has to sell him or herself to the college admissions com officer or committee. And they do a heck of a job of it, because they walk in there, and first of all, they know why they want to go to college. They don't go because it's the next thing to do. They go because they have a goal in life. And now, Dan, are you telling me that they don't have any recommendations from the school? Any from the school. You don't write a recommendation for somebody? I may at times, at times, not, not, not always, not okay, that frequently, make... write a personal recommendation. It'll be on my own stationery, not on school stationery, and I may say I've known this person personally and so forth. But that doesn't hold much water if you know anything yeah, about I admissions know. with admissions people. The school itself, as a matter of fact, has a formal letter that it's, that it's been sending for 20 years saying, we don't write recommendations. You have to talk to the student and let the student explain to you why they think they're qualified Indeed. to attend your college. Again, justification. That's right. And the students have to do it. And believe me, we've gotten into the whole spectrum. Everything. Uh -huh. We've gotten into Harvard, Wesley, and UCAL, and, and, and every other school. As a matter of fact, uh, one, of our, one of our graduates is now doing a PhD in mathematics at MIT, went to the University of Rochester. Is that right? <laughs> that's right. Yeah. That's, I'm not surprised at all. I really am not. But let me ask you this. Now, how long would a student have to be in your institution before he could uh, uh, pass a thesis, before he could come up for it? Would you allow this after a year, let's say? If it's rare. We s tell people we would really not, per not like to allow people to present a th their thesis before two years. But there have been, on occasion, people who have come as early as a year after they've been here, and they have to be, they have to be quite remarkable kids yeah, to do yeah. that. But on the other hand, you can't make rules about things like this. All right, now listen, uh, go back to the beginning of this again. How do you go about getting your student? We talked a little bit about faculty. How do you go about getting students who will be comfortable in this place? It's, and, it, I wish I had an answer that I could be comfortable with. The fact is that we, do a tr we make a tremendous effort to publicize our existence throughout the in whole greater Boston area. We, we attract students from 40 and 50 miles away mm -hmm. who commute an hour, an hour and a half each way every day. Today, with 140 students, I think we probably have students from 50 or 60 different communities. We publicize with the guidance, school guidance counselors because there are people to whom parents and children. Are they comfortable with advising their students to come to this place? Well, it's the same old story. By now, you're here 20 years, you're legitimate. Okay. Okay? You buy your legitimacy with staying power. Uh -huh. And with just being normal, decent people. You know, we talk to them, I go to their conferences, I make presentations, papers at the Mass School Counselors Association at the New England Conference on Counseling and Development. I present papers, I write articles, we talk, we, we mix. That is precisely correct. It's that must go on. terribly important. Yeah. Okay. Now, not only with counselors and guidance counselors, we do scattershot mailings to, to focal, focal audiences and you know, people who subscribe to certain magazines or whatever. We get on TV. We do a tremendous campaign of trying to get on TV. Right now, while you're here, there's a camera crew from the That's local right. CBS <clears throat> affiliate who's going to be doing a half hour show on us in the fall. We work hard to get that. That doesn't come out of the blue. We cultivate the stations, we go on radio, we get newspaper articles written about us. We have a very vigorous promotional campaign, mm -hmm. which we put energy into. And well, we talk in every college and university that we can possibly talk in. We, cert we mail to every professor of education in the entire greater area. Is that right? And every year. <coughs> and we will go to any course and pr make our presentation. And believe me, it's brutal work. It's sure nights, it's afternoons, sure it's, you wish you'd be home. Yeah. But believe me, it's a wonderful path because the only way you get known is if you work, you put in your dues. Nobody's right. going to come and say you're great people just because you're sitting there. Yeah. You've got to go out there and beat the pavement. Yeah. All and right. That's the way you get but, known. But, all right. Now here's a student who's thinking about one, uh, about this place. Open admissions, Norm. Open admissions. All right. But the point is, he says to himself, "Is this an alternative I should pursue? Would you allow him to come and spend a few days?" A week. Just, uh, we have. We have a, yes. We have a very interesting program which we instituted almost at the beginning called the visiting week 
and for a very nominal fee they can come and spend the week here as if they were act normal students, you know, treated just like everybody else. And that's been a boon because that gives them a chance to really see whether this is the place for them or not. Does your school committee vote on uh, accepting Absolutely or how do you not. decide it's on It's basically 100% open admissions. Now, if there is a student who presents, remember, we don't have psychiatric services. We don't. We need people who can who can really be responsible for themselves. So if a student presents themselves, and this happens so rarely that I, I can hardly remember when it's happened in right. 20 years. But if a student presents himself, who is clearly not capable, has some handicap that is clearly not suitable to this environment, then it would be voted on by by an organ of the school meeting. But. I have to, you shouldn't stress that because it almost happens. Right. It's a self-selection process. A parent of a child who has a serious handicap that needs attention is going to see that we don't give it and won't want to subject their children right. to it. Okay. Well, another thing then, would there be a maximum number that you would want to stay at beyond which you could not, not at handle? At this point, I can't answer that question. You can't. I, I know one thing. Every growth has been, every growth in numbers so far has been accompanied by a tremendous growth in spirit and energy. And my own personal feeling is I'm not saying the sky's the limit, but the larger the school, the better. In other words, so, you can handle 200 and, and... Oh, I don't have... I don't even begin to question it in my own mind up to 500. You I don't, don't even begin to question it. Because I know how easy it is in communities of 500 people to know each other. I've been in communities of 500 who after three or four months of interacting the way the kids interact in here, they all know each other, they all know who each other are mm -hmm. and so forth. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, it's academic. It's, it's for me to discuss whether it's right. 700 or right. 800. But the point is that a lot of kids, there's more energy, more stimulation, right. and more chance of mo meeting other children your own age who are interested in the same things you do, and that's more fun. Yeah. You know, it's bleak when you're alone. Oh, you better believe it is. Let me ask you a cut one or two other questions, Dan. And then maybe you have a closing comment of things that we have not discussed, but, uh, but is there any overriding problem that your, your school faces? Any particular problem? For example, is there a lack of receptivity? Now, you mentioned that you've been around long enough now to have uh, acquired uh, integrity and, and respect from, from area people and this sort of thing, professional people. But is there any overriding problem? Financial, respect by people, attendance of st or selection of students, identifying students, the only, the, not really. I mean, one can always sit and bemoan the fact you don't have enough money or this and yeah. that, but that's not really the case. The real, the only problem we have is we'd like to be bigger, and that will take time. It doesn't happen overnight. Yeah. I do feel that the larger the size at this point, the better, the, the more viable the community is. Yeah. Yeah. But at, at, at 140, we're quite viable. Mm -hmm. So it's not a serious problem. We just like to grow more. All the other things, they're not really problems. I mean, let me put it this way. The standard community that's committed to the old ways is obviously not going to wave its arms in joy mm -hmm. at something radically different from what they do. But you understand that if you have any perspective of history, you don't expect it to be any different. You just have to go on about your business and do your thing yeah, yeah. and do it well. Yeah. If you do it well and if your graduates acquit themselves well and if you're honest and if you don't look down at other people, eventually people's minds will open. It just takes time. Yeah. Look, I have something to tell you on yeah, but there, There's one other thing I have to ask in this. It just, I don't want us to forget. I tell my students a lot, I speak about it in meetings a lot, I want people to know that teachers ought to be writing. Now your school does some writing, that's how I happen to know about it. Prolifically. We yeah. write and write and write and write as much as we can and we just distribute our writings as widely as we can. It's terribly important. Yes. It's terribly important. At least it gives people a chance to put their hands on something concrete and mull it over and think about it. Yeah. If, if you don't write, you're anonymous. Yeah. That's now at this point, true. future is... Uh, the future that is uh, the next three to five years is exciting. You're into uh, what it's going to become. We're, we're, <laughs> we're always optimistic <coughs> about the future. And just the fact that you've come down here is something that we view with great delight. I mean, it shows that we've been able somehow to bridge uh, several Oh, there's no question. I read a, your stuff. a several hundred mile distance, yeah. and uh, I feel comfortable with you. I know you, you gentlemen feel comfortable in the school. You, you show it in a million different ways. That's worth everything, and that kind of thing sustains us and keeps us going. That's, yeah. that's all I have. That's my end. Yeah, oh, there's no question about that's it. That's what no. sustains us, yeah. and I'm sure in the end, people will realize that free kids who, who, who determine their own destinies are the way of the 21st century. Yeah. It couldn't have been summarized better, Dan. On behalf of all of the students and faculty who will see this in the next six weeks even, I want you to know how much we appreciate all Thank the time you for you've given us and, and all the warmth you've given us. Thank you Thank for you coming. I appreciate it. In the following few minutes, we're going to take a really exciting look at the Sudbury Valley School in the flesh. 
Here we are entering the campus of that building. There's a long walkway into it and driveway, parking lot outside. Really very interesting grounds. This is a school that is based upon three individual rights, three root ideas, one of which is a stress on human individual rights. Another is the stress on political democracy. And a third is a stress on equal opportunity for all people. This school is remarkable in a number of ways. One of those ways has to do with the freedom that young people have to work and to study, to play, to be with one another in different locations depending upon their own interest. And here there is a deep reverence for interest. There is no hierarchy of privilege. As you see in these pictures, you will find the instructors and the students are relating to one another as student to student, as friend to friend. There is no privilege. Indeed, one of the students remarked during the course of the making of our tape that, that the student was not aware of the fact that there was such a thing as a director or a leader. No one has thought of as a director or a leader in this school. They do away with that kind of privilege-oriented talk. This is a co-equal institution in which the idea is to get kids to acquire an understanding of what it means to be responsible. There are times even when they vote on who they will have for teachers during the following year. And when they vote, they engage in casting ballots for every teacher who's available in the system and who's like, who would like to come back next year. That's what they were doing in one of those pictures. They have a variety of courses that they offer, but they also depend very much on community resources to help extend the curriculum and make it available to students depending upon the interests that emerge. We talk with people in the school, and one of those people is a, a certified sci psychiatrist, a man who has committed many hours and many years. Indeed, he has been working in this school since 1981 because he has a deep and profound commitment to the idea of allowing kids to develop freely in light of their particular interests and not in light of, of what teachers and school systems believe kids ought to be learning. There is a great stress on this. Indeed, in one part of a book, dealing with this particular program, Mr. Greenberg, who is one of the important instructors in this, in this school, says, in the school, the basic building block must be, and I quote, the responsible individual whose sense of life derives from his having overcome with his own strength the great obstacles and errors and temptations that have been strewn in his path. Indeed, there are many opportunities for kids to pursue things which create problems for them. There is a large pond for fishing. There are large areas for a variety of outdoor work. They have a large number of laboratories. The important thing, however, throughout this program is that the student, the young person, will have chosen on his own to pursue the stuff that's available for him to learn. One becomes responsible in the theory of this school by engaging in activity that's designed to achieve ends. One does not learn responsibility by being told. One achieves responsibility by acting in a responsible way. Sudbury Valley School, Framingham, Massachusetts. May it be the outlook for the future of American education. We're getting soaked. We are getting soaked. <laughs>